Okay, to some, Christy Loy is a music writer, but to me, she is a local treasure. Christy, <laughs> how are things? <laughs> things are very, very busy. Things are hopping along, but they're fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, no problem. Okay, so I read an article you did for the Houston Press recently talking about some of the, the hate you get for your coverage mm. of the local music scene. My question is this. Why do men seem to have a tougher time accepting criticism when it comes from a woman? Gosh, you know, um, I think uh, that's a great question. I think a lot of, it, you know, it's not just men. I, I uh, run into women online and in person who have a lot of issue with a woman having a strong opinion or voice or power. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes people uncomfortable, you know, when... When a woman is outside of the particular normal standard of power, right, if, if they're operating outside of what is deemed like, you know, normal, strong, independent woman with, with a loud opinion, that makes people <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> they don't necessarily like that. And um, they want to push back against that. And, and the quickest way to do that is, you know, to, to be ad hominem about it and just insult. It's that knee-jerk reaction online. People just, ah, well, you must be an idiot, so therefore I will call you an idiot. I get the idea that a lot of male musicians, they don't feel like, like women can truly, like, quote-unquote, get rock music. Would you agree with that? You know, um, there seems to be some kind of pervasive belief with some men about that. It's funny, when I did a lot of research, and um, I think LA Weekly picked it up, and what I did was in that article, I kind of explored, I did like the, a lot of research about questions from male journalists to female musicians. Mm -hmm. And what I found over and over again was males would have this idea that women could not play music, that somebody else must be helping them and somebody else must be in the kitchen kind of cooking and doing the recipe <laughs> work and doing everything else for the woman. And, you know, one of the biggest, um, not the biggest, but probably the loudest person against that was was Lizzie Hale. Mm. Yeah, and she had a lot to say about that. And there was one question in particular from a Guitar World journalist that asked her, why do you think women can't play? <laughs> it's just like, you <laughs> why know, do you think you suck? Questions. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, she, she handled it very well. And she, she said, well, um, I, I guess I don't know what you're asking me. Are you saying <laughs> I can't play or, you know, and they, they seem to handle it well, but you know, the media is kind of, kind of sets women up to not be good musicians, you know, like you have, revolver and and the the calendar that comes out every year of, right. of these women right and it's not a focus on their music it's a focus on their looks it's a focus on everything else but their talent and skill and that happens over and over and over again for female musicians and of course that bleeds over to female music journalists naturally it's just an extension of this kind of belief that's out there that says women can't possibly have skills or knowledge Somebody else must be doing it for them. And if they do have skills or knowledge, they're not going to be to the level of a male. They're just not going to meet the counterpart. And that just doesn't make any sense to me. That that speaks to a deep sexism in our culture that, you know, obviously needs to be addressed because I, I don't know if anyone out there would agree, but women are also people. They just happen <laughs> to be <laughs> people with vaginas. That's the only difference. They just they have vaginas and but they also have brains. It's crazy. I know you, you've you've gotten a lot of shit over the years for for some of the stuff you've you've written. What yeah. can you think of the worst thing that somebody has said to you? Like first thing off top of your head, like what's the one thing that somebody said in response to one of your oh, stories gosh. where you were like, "Holy shit!" Gosh, you know, wow, the one thing. Oh, why are you doing this to me? Yeah, <laughs> it's like ten <laughs> things just popped up. You know, go kill yourself is pretty oh. common. Gosh, I don't know about one thing. You know, I could give you like a couple examples that were just truly horrendous. Uh, there was a local musician who who threatened me with physical violence. Jeez. That was that was upsetting. And then he that wasn't enough. He had to stalk me every single day at 5 a.m. through Messenger and send me these horrible messages just to ruin my day. I blocked him. He made another account. It was a nightmare. Then um, I found that on I didn't even know this. I found that I'm apparently some kind of, 
you know, pinata on Reddit <laughs> where random angry males just take, you know, just hits at all my writing. I found a YouTuber who uh, dedicated an entire hour to one of my articles. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, where he went um, line by line trying to disprove every single thing I said. And I thought, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like, this guy spent a lot of time. Like, this, I was kind of complimented. Like, this is amazing that somebody, <laughs> somebody cared enough to make an hour-long YouTube video about my work. So I contacted him, and I was like, hey, thank you. <laughs> like, I mean, you cared so much much nobody has ever done that for me thank you <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, in the article i you referenced uh like a local radio show host uh, oh, going to facebook gosh. and offering to quote beat your vagina yeah uh, is it possible that he was simply trying to romance you <laughs> <laughs> well if he was he's going about it all the wrong way um <laughs> you know it takes at least four days to to get to beat my vagina now, i'm kidding <laughs> Totally kidding. Two dates, tops. Um, no, he, it, that, you know, that guy um, had a really hard time last year. And um, he, you know, he had some personal problems. We were actually friends at one point. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought we were getting along. Something happened. Something I wrote or something I said really ticked him off and kind of just put him on the opposite end of liking me to hating me. And then I saw all of these terrible post and one where he I, I think he had taken a Betty White quote and then um kind of dismantled it and added my name instead it was the Betty White quote about a uh, you know if if uh men are so strong why can't they take a, a beating like a vagina or something I don't know I'm, <laughs> I'm terrible at paraphrase but anyway so he inserted my name in there like if Chrissy Loy is such a tough journalist why can't she take a beating like a vagina or something like that anyway Jesus. it was totally offensive it was really off-putting and nobody in the comments of course I'm watching this I don't comment on it nobody in the comments stood up for me except the owner from Walters who hates my guts to begin with. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So I thought, what in the hell is going on with this music scene? And I just, you know, I just thought this is enough. Yeah. I, I, you know, this is enough. You know, no one's going to drag my name through the dirt for a while. Like I just kind of turned off my own voice and said, you know, I just needed to take a sabbatical. Right. And that was that was really good for me. You mentioned the scene. What would you say is like the most entitled scene that you've ever had to cover? Oh, Los Angeles, without a doubt. You, you know, that, I mean, I think everybody gives them like the pretentious award of all time. <laughs> like everybody there is so entitled to things that they have not yet earned. They've only have these treasures in their minds, right? Sure. But you, sh you should love me because I have treasures in my mind. I guess, um, you know, Houston's a little different, and I give Houston a lot of slack because I get it. They are constantly in the shadow of Austin. I mean, look at us. We're in the top 10 market, and we get passed up for major concerts all the time. Right. It is so annoying. You know, a band will go from Dallas to Austin, and it's like we don't even exist. <laughs> and, and, and that's got to be terribly frustrating to the musicians here because we have musicians here who care about music tremendously. We're passed over all the time. We're not looked at as valuable as Austin, which is ridiculous. Anyone who's who's been here five minutes knows that Houston has a plethora of different music styles. So I get that there's this kind of tension in the city among musicians trying to get recognized and not being able to do that, even though they have tremendous talent. And I empathize with that. And that's part of the reason why I am a music journalist, because I want to bring attention to those bands who deserve it and who need it. And I love doing that. With that tension in this town, there's also this kind of, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's this kind of, it's got to be another feeling from jealousy that, you know, or this, this it's kind like, of. It's almost like a middle child syndrome. Yes. Nobody's paying attention to me. <laughs> nobody's paying attention to me. Damn it. Yeah. You know, and I can't tell you how many musicians in this town I've met where I'm like, hey, you know, I write for the Houston Press. I think you're really talented and I'd like to do a spotlight article on you. And the first thing they say in response instead of like, hey, great, you know, here's my information is 
you know, I've been waiting 10 years for media to recognize me. <laughs> like, whoa, hey, sorry, I'm late. I didn't know you were already angry at me. <laughs> what the hell? I mean, I'm telling you, this happened like in the past several weeks, you know, just somebody very angry that the media isn't following them around recording every event. And I just think like, dude, the media isn't doing that for anyone but Beyonce. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, you're suffering from delusions of grandeur here. Calm down. <laughs> so uh, you, you mentioned Beyonce. She's somebody that, I mean, everybody holds her on, on the highest pedestal. Um, yeah. And, and in the world of rock, there's been a lot of great female rock stars. Do you think that a female rock star's greatness is held on the same level as a male rock star's greatness? Oh, absolutely not. You know, um, I don't know if you saw um, Billboard. I, I think it was a Lifetime Achievement Award or something very similar to that. A awarded Madonna with this this prestigious award. Mm -hmm. I think it was back in maybe November or December. And she had this speech about the struggles that she's had. Well, it's kind of hard to imagine Madonna struggling, right? She's right. this huge name. <laughs> she's enormously wealthy. Everybody knows her around the world. But she, in this very detailed speech, explained how it was hard for her just because she's a female and all the struggles that she's had to endure. And what really scared me about her speech was she remembered back in the 90s getting some very harsh criticism from a particular critic and she not only remembered that criticism and quoted it but also quoted the music critic's name yeah. like she remembered <laughs> that years later like hey i remember when this person said this and how that hurt her this is a real thing for women no matter how famous they are this continues there's this expectation she talks about like how she's grown older and people aren't really looking at her music anymore they just look at how she's aging or sure. what she looks like or what she's wearing, you know, still to this day, even though she's incredibly famous and talented, people still aren't talking about her music. It's tough to nail down like one female rock star to hold up and say, oh, this is the greatest ever. But like, are there a few you yeah. can kind of point to as what you think are the best female rock stars ever? Oh, gosh, you know. Wow. Um, the best ever. Jeez Louise. You know, I, I always kind of fall back on that music that, that kind of brought me, you know, into music itself. Sure. Like those kind of foundational women like Janis Joplin, Billie mm -hmm. Holiday, Nina Simone, you know, the, the greats, the greats that, you know, capture such an incredible feeling. They're iconic. You know, we always lean back on them. They're so amazing. You know, I... <laughs> You're just you're talking to me after a week of listening to PJ Harvey. I just oh, went through a, a terrible breakup. So oh. yeah, so like uh, I'm listening to her and I'm like, oh gosh, she's just such a goddess, you know. But there's so many goddesses in rock. There's so many, and they do so many different things. They have so many incredible functions, right. you know. For in that way, like I think women are blessed because we have so many different functions in music, and it seems like men are really tied down to like one function sure you know you're a you're a rock star and you're this this giant man with this giant penis and that's all you do yeah right but women can do so many different things and they can get away with it you know i think those roles really need to be expanded and i'm excited to see hopefully in the very near future that they will be shifting kind of to metal it seems like the newest trend in metal is to, to have like the super hot pinup model female singer fronting kind of like generic metal. Uh, <laughs> so the point is obviously, you know, stir up boners, sell a few albums. Yeah. But do you think this can actually kind of open doors for women in metal? You know, there's there's a great feminist argument about that, you know. Like, and, and I appreciate this kind of idea that as soon as a woman enters a man's world, it's shocking and people talk about it, but then it becomes normalized. And then that does open the door for other females. Mm -hmm. My problem is I don't want any door opening to mediocrity. Like, I don't, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't appreciate that. I don't need it. I don't want it. I'm not going to praise it. Now, if you do something that's, you know, trailblazing and, 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 incredibly unique and creative then that's something different right right and that's that's what janice joplin and nina simone and all the billy holiday that's what all these greats did because it was 
groundbreaking. It was epic. So I totally know who you're talking about <laughs> with these female fronted kind of um, mediocre bands, right? Right. And I don't think that that's helping women. It's just normalizing their place in metal. And here's the problem. They're, they always had a place in metal. They mm. always had a place in metal, but people were constantly pushing them out. Now you have these women in metal, but they're not doing anything that's noteworthy. So it's kind of like they're just a bunch of voices being drowned out by their own mediocrity. Right. It's like, it, it's okay if you're giving me a boner, but don't like, don't, don't get in my case. Right. Don't do anything that's that's outside of acceptable, you know, hot topic metal. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> don't do anything creative or unique because, you know, that's we, we don't want that. We just want to sell boners to guys. Right. And speak, you know, speaking of of that, you know, I went to uh, I think it was last spring. The Butcher Babies came mm -hmm. to um, uh, House of Blues. Yeah. And they were there was some some other very notable acts. Very good. And they put on a great show, and I had seen them before, and I actually like Heidi and Carla very, very much as people. I think they're awesome, and I think they have a couple very good songs, and I love I love their take on feminism. I think that they're solid women, and, and they're doing the right things, but when I looked out at the crowd, and because I've reviewed their album, I know every word. I don't just listen to an album once. I listen to it several times. I look out at the crowd, and it's just full of men. It's full <laughs> of men. I'm the only female around. I know every word to every song. These men don't know any words. <laughs> They're for the titties. The, exactly. They're like, oh, please let there be a wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> please, Jesus, hear my prayer. Yeah. <laughs> speaking, <laughs> of, uh, speaking of mediocrity and metal, okay? I got into like a real heated discussion last month. Uh, I was talking about a story where the new singer of Queensryche, um, uh -huh. he was taking a lot of shit for posting a meme that insinuated that Trump and Putin were buddies, God forbid. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. so here's my question. At what point did rock music stop being like the music of rebellion and start being the music of kind of like mindless conservatism? You know, that I'm... I love this question. I love this question so much. And actually, another another writer at Houston Press and I, his name's Chris Lane. He's he's great. He covers metal too. We were having this conversation just last week because I don't know if you're aware, but Tom Array of Slayer had posted something on right. Slayer's Instagram account where he had photoshopped Trump into right their band photo. Right. And that caused quite a bit of controversy. Well, you know, if you think, if you go back, right, in time of metal, it's always been kind of a white boys club from the very beginning. So there were, and if you look at like Slayer's lyrics, there's some kind of sympathies towards Nazis and, and things like that. Mm. And, and there's, there's, there's always been a, a heavy vein of misogyny. I mean, look at bands like freaking Anal Cunt. I mean, sure. come on. It's, you know, these bands exist. We can't deny it. Right. So that kind of, you know, very, I wouldn't even call it conservatism. I'd just call it outright, like, just Nazism. Very alt-right kind of shit there. Um, I'd say that's always existed. I would say that metal was founded on this rejection of religion, but wasn't necessarily political until the 80s, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you get into the 90s when metal kind of died for a moment. Now it's come back, right? We're in the 2000s. Here we are, 2017. I'm really dating myself. <laughs> but, you know, here we come in and we see metal. And now metal is diverse, right? Mm -hmm. You have these women. You have people of color. You have queer. You have all different kinds of people. And now you have the backlash of the old metal right. versus the new metal. And the new metal is young and is not going to listen to that kind of hyper alt right, you know, conspiracy theory, <laughs> Trump loving kind of shit. They're just not going to listen to that. The thing I is, mean, how can you be a fan of Queensryche? This is the band. I mean, uh, Operation Mind Crime. It's all like anti-religion, anti-right wing, and, and all that shit. And now here you are, like a fifty-year-old fuck, telling everybody to just shut up and do what the president says. <laughs> I know, right? But there is a kind of... Okay, so, so I'm going to say stuff right now that's going to piss off a lot of people. But if you 
And that's okay, because at the end of the day, I still love metal, too. And so I can acknowledge this and compartmentalize what I'm about to say and still love metal. If you look at metal, it is going to attract... Okay, hold on. (laughs) It's going to attract a very insecure kind of person. And let me explain. Because metal is hyper-masculine. Sure. Right? And it has this angry front. It offers this kind of outlet of frustration because it's misogynistic and because it's anti-religion. It's going to attract a kind of male mentality that says, hey, I'm tough, I'm big, I'm brave, even if I don't believe that deep down inside. I've got this facade going and metal suits that perfectly. It's going to attract that kind of very insecure kind of person. Now, that's not saying that all listeners of metal are like that. Certainly, I'm not like that. You're not like that. But if you look at the genre as a whole, it's angry. It's misogynistic. It's very white boy kind of club, especially in the beginning. So it's going to attract that kind of Trump voter. To me, you know like, I mean? I, I, it, it started to dawn on me. I was at one of these, uh, like one of these summer festival deals. Uh-huh. And um, uh, one of the headliners was the dreaded five finger death punch. Oh God. And in the middle of their set, they played a commercial for the army. Yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah. they left the stage, and they played a fucking commercial for the army. And I said, what, yeah. what is going on here? Like, I'm looking around, and everybody's, you know, once again, all white dudes, and, you know, star-spangled, yeah. fucking all this yep. shit. I mean, it's such fucking mediocrity. The metal that I yeah. always loved was, like, dangerous, and you didn't want anyone else to get it. So, uh, Five Finger Death Punch. Uh, you know, Nickelback, you look at every uh, shine down, like everybody who's at the top right now. Like, why are we embracing such goddamn mediocrity? You know, and I have so many opinions about bands like Five Finger Death Punch. And I actually wrote something very recently in the Houston Press about them. Mm-hmm. Like we we had this we'll do these kind of group things like bands, you know, bands you should love, bands you should listen to, bands you should Totally ignore, right? So we had one, bands you should hate. And of course, I immediately said Five Finger Death Punch. Not only does their music sound like somebody threw a guitar and an amp and a wood chipper, it's terrible. It's <laughs> awful. <laughs> There's nothing special about it. But that lead singer, the oh. moment that the police verified that he had domestic assault charges against him to the point where he almost killed his ex-wife, that should have been the moment the band said, we are parting our ways right. with this lead singer. We do not accept this behavior. But instead, they were quiet about it. They didn't say anything. And all of those horrible fans came to their defense. You know, well, she's a bitch and she deserved it. Okay. <laughs> right. right there. Right there. You have a problem. You have a problem. Do you remember, it wasn't last summer, but the summer before, when everyone on the internet was arguing about the rebel flag. Right. Right. The Confederate flag and Mushroom Head from Ohio, of all places, <laughs> right. defends the Confederate flag. Like, hello, you're not Confederate, but they defend <laughs> the Confederate flag. And, 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 you know, here we have, you know, Phil Anselmo, you know, d- doing these Nazi signs. So that has always kind of been in metal. There's always been this kind of trailer park white boy aspect to metal. And I don't think it will ever go away because of the genre and and the the emotions that it creates in people i think that it's always going to attract that kind of person but you know that's going to piss a lot of your listeners off (laughs) and i don't want to pull a sarah fitzgerald right now so i mean that's the thing like you mentioned uh you know we've been talking about five finger death punch ivan moody when you talk about you know the 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 frail dude with his chest puffed out and his jaw yeah jet, like that's him like if there was any uh if, if you could make a mascot for that type of dickhead it would yeah. be ivan moody i mean it's fucking insane you know and i had to tell um it wasn't them it was another bro metal kind of band mm-hmm. which i won't mention but um their publicists came to me and you know of course i get a lot of publicist emails and the publicist just would not let it go why won't you cover this band what is the deal you know we need public publicity we can't get any we don't know what the problem is and i finally told him you are talking to liberal media <laughs> <laughs> i am going to never cover your bro metal crap i right. never you know i finally just had to tell him like i 
look, I get to choose. I get to choose, and thank God I get to choose. And sure, I get assignments sometimes, and I cover other bands, but they always deserve it. I never cover a band that doesn't deserve it, and your band does not deserve it. They don't deserve press. Get out of my face. (laughs) Follow Christy Loy on Facebook. Read her articles, her reviews. (laughs) In the Houston press. Is there anything you want to plug? Oh, gosh. You know, I saw a show this Friday at Rockefellers. I'm really excited about uh, Fiddle Witch and the Demons of Doom. Baron Von Baumblast is playing, too. Oh, Allison wow. Gibson, she's part of that band. You know, she was in Manhole. Mm-hmm. She's she's amazing. Joe Bird, who is the fiddle player of Fiddle Witch. Um, I think they were they were there was some talk about them being nominated for a Grammy. So that is going to be an incredible show, and I I want to plug that on their behalf because th- that's two two women in Houston music who are just amazing. Okay, Christy, I'm going to go ahead and let you go. We've run out of time. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. The lovely and talented Christy Loy, ladies and gentlemen. Mm-hmm.